Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for July 17th, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopp Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cyber Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the technical landscape of ransomware, threat models, and defense models with Bart Town Miller and Alyssa Heyman. Um, Bart is a professor of computer sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and co-PI of the Trusted CI project. Alyssa is a senior scientist at Trusted CI and an associate professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, um, webinar attendees are welcome to type questions in the chat. Um, just click on the chat icon. Um, we will be monitoring the chat during the presentation, but we will also leave time for questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand things over to Bart and Alyssa. Welcome. Well, thank you, Jeanette. And good morning, everyone. Um, today, we want to talk about something that's been on lots of people's mind, which is ransomware. Um, and you know, it's not just not just all of you, but us too. Alyssa has a position with the University in Barcelona, and university got zeroed by ransomware. And it took them many, many, many months to recover from that. So we're all uh, taking this very seriously here. So so it wasn't we want, my fault though, eh, Bart? No, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't if they had listened to you, they would have been better off. Um, so we want to try to get off uh, to get a how ransomware exploits a system. What does it do? Not how it gets in. So lots of people are telling you about just good cybersecurity uh, practices. Um, uh, you know, don't click on these links and things like that. We're not going to be talking about how it gets in because ransomware gets in in much the same way um, that any other. Uh, kinds of uh, malware or implant gets in. So we're going to be talking about what it looks, what it can do to your system, how it does it, and how you might detect it and recover from it. So we're going to talk about uh, strategies um, for, you know, damage, uh, for minimizing damage, accelerating recovery, and ultimately um, we're trying to develop strategies for recovery. So, so our talk, our goal today is give you insights into all of these things. So um, we're going to start off with some basic just to get everybody on the same page. So for many of you, there'll be some familiar things here. And then I, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll get to uh, uh, we'll get to some stuff that you've you've not thought of before. And so so stay tuned for that. So um, you know, if we look at some of the things that can uh, the bad things that can happen. You know, we're talking about vandalism, ransom, and blackmail. Uh, vandalism is just doing damage and um, not having any particular thing you can do about it. It's just, it's just destroying something. And in fact, if, if you've heard about the NotPetya uh, attack that hit the mayor's shipping company, that was vandalism, though it looked like ransomware. It wasn't anything you can do. We're gonna be looking at, um, um, we're gonna be looking at two things. Uh, one is, you know, what the attackers would talk about, they're gonna demand payment. And if you don't, if you don't pay us, um, you don't get, to use your system again. And the other is blackmail, which is if you don't pay us, we're going to tell some secret that you have and maybe you don't want other people to know. So, okay. So, um, so ransomware, again, this is real basic, just want to get us on the same page, is software that tries to extort you or, or cause some penalties. And, and it could be, um, and we think about two things. One is, um, where they took your system and modified or encrypted or deleted data that you cared about. And, and the other is where they exfiltrated, it's extracting. Uh, we like we use the word exfil in shorthand. And, um, <clears throat> extracted data from your system. And um, the ransom ransomers want payment um, either to restore your system to normal operation or to promise you that they won't release your data to the public. Now, of course, if they ransomed you and they restored your system, they could always unrestore it. And uh, if you hadn't figured out how they got in, and if they didn't release your data today, they could always release it tomorrow. So you just have to decide about how much is there honor among thieves, I guess. Um, 
we've been doing as part of our ransomware study, we've been doing a survey of active ransomware. And this is just a partial list of active ransomware out there. And uh, somebody releases something new and interesting, then the script kiddies jump, write a hundred variations of it that attack in different ways. And um, but this is, uh, oh, uh, this just give you an idea that's really out there. And, you know, it's hitting the place. Um, you know, uh, here we see Baltimore's um, public service, including their water supply, got hit by ransomware. It's scary. Um, uh, and these are all these are all here on the ransomware um, of, against the water utility because people could shut off your water, over chlorinate it, which could poison you, uh, damage, and so it, it would it would fail permanent for long periods of time. So this is this is kind of an interesting thing. It was so interesting that in listen my software security course, we actually at home and security run a tabletop exercise with us on on just exactly the scenario attack on the local water utility. And everybody heard about um, you know pipeline attack which shut off supplies to a large part of the East Coast. Um, the fortunate news is we threw our whole um, cyber infrastructure, cyber defensive infrastructure at that and um, not only restored that after an extended period, but we they actually got back the bitcoins from the thieves. So the thieves they actually found the Bitcoin wallet that the thieves had uh, collected the money in, and they collected three million dollars. But there actually was five million dollars wallets stole back. He being the FBI stole back an extra two million dollars from the thieves. So this one has a happy ending, though it did cause a lot of high gas prices for a while. All right, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Lissa. Um, and she's going to work on it for a little bit, then you'll get to hear me again later on. Yeah, so um, the reality, right, is that you eventually will be uh, hit by ransomware, right? Like, how many of you have been ever hit by a virus, right, or malware, right? So it's uh, not about if you will be attacked and exploited by ransomware, but uh, when you will be attacked and exploited by ransomware. And there's things that, I mean, we are not going to discuss today, as Bart said, how ransomware um, enters your system, but they, there are kind of ways that don't um, even depend on you, right? On you, right? Like, for example, if in your software uh, stack, there is a zero-day vulnerability. I mean, you don't know that, right? Or you can teach people a lot. I mean, don't think about that you are not monitoring them 24-7, um, right? Or if uh, your system has some patch vulnerabilities, yeah, that's uh, on you. I mean, that shouldn't happen, right? But, um, it, but in any case, we are, not dis uh, we are not discussing that. What we, I mean, understand is that you eventually will be hit. So um, you have to, I mean, you have to be careful about kind of preventing attacks, but it doesn't mean that, you know, like, oh, okay, even that I'm gonna be hit, I don't, that. no, I mean, you still care, right? But you have to go beyond that. And you really need to have um, the, the deal with kind of detection and to know, oh, I'm being um, attacked, right? And uh, be able to uh, react as soon as possible. I mean, the you react, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the better for you. And um, to do that, that, I mean, when I say react, it means having a recovery strategies um, for uh, ransomware. So the idea is to have, be able to detect as quickly as possible that you are being attacked and uh, to recover. And to do that, well, I mean, nothing comes for free, right? So you will have to do several things. First is, uh, you know, we strongly recommend writing uh, with your host, like for example, using virtual machines that will be, that will make your system, uh, let's say a bit less difficult to recover. And uh, of course, like many things in security, there is not such a thing like you push one button and you are done, right? 
we also recommend you know uh, using detection tools to um, we will uh, run somewhere in depth so we will also mention what the tools can uh, help uh, you with and um, we will talk about uh, having uh, serious backup strategies and not only having uh, the, those uh, strategies but also running recovery exercises just to make sure that uh, uh, able to recover. Next slide, please. And to understand a bit more about uh, ransomware, but you know the first idea to come that comes to everybody's minds when talking about ransomware is oh they will uh, encrypt uh, the files in my my file system. And true, that um, the first. Um, a basic operation that ransom, ransomware can do to you. And they doesn't even have to encrypt all your files. They right? can encrypt kind of the first k bytes of um, your files, right? Make them uh, unusable. And uh, they promise, oh, if you pay, we'll uh, give you kind of the encryption key or we will reverse this, the encryption. And that's an attack to availability. Right? Your files are not uh, available anymore. But also ransomware can uh, prevent a user from accessing the system. For example, changing a user's password or the password for root, or um, maybe creating a password for booting your system, right? So that's uh, also a way uh, for ransomware to prevent you from accessing the system. That's another attack to confidence. A different attack is what Bart was mentioning before. It's a exfiltrate data from your system, right? Kind of stealing data that has uh, maybe proprietary information, like, oh, I have uh, the formula for the product I'm developing, private information, sensitive data. And then blackmailing the system owner and say, pay, or otherwise I will um, I will reveal this information. And this is an attack to confidentiality. And one more operation that a ransomware can do to your system is uh, to delete your file. And then that's another attack to availability, right? But in order to um, that deletion be different than just vandalism, if they delete your files and that is, there's nothing to be done and that's uh, vandalism. But for that to be able to be reversible, it has to be combined with exfiltration. So when you pay, they transfer your files back to your system. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, well, where can your system, let, let's see, your system is vulnerable to ransomware, of course, but it's uh, um, vulnerable. I mean, your uh, click, please. Your um, typical, your system will be typically running probably Windows, uh, Linux, or Mac OS, and they kind of might kind of that operating system might allow the, the ransomware to kind of affect. Encrypt your files, like we were saying. But click ransomware and uh, go beyond that. It can affect um, your uh, BIOS UL feed, right? Like the code that it's between the operating system and the hardware. And it's basically like any firmware in your system can be vulnerable to attack. Click, click. And um, it happens that there are more places in your system that are vulnerable to ransomware. It happens that your motherboard has a, a separate CPU, I mean, in addition to your architecture's uh, CPU, right? To your core. It has a CPU there and uh, with it, and that could be a target for ransomware as well. And uh, surprise. It happens that ransomware can attack also the power or cooling system of um, your system, like the control the fans or 
for um, the power manager charging and click. It's uh, your battery has a CPU and means a, a, a separate processor with its own separate firmware that can be also vulnerable to um, ransomware. And uh, is there anything more? Yeah, it happens that your keyboard has also a processor and it's separate firmware. And for an attacker can't, ransomware can't um, control the keys that will be um, the keystrokes, right? And what will be typed into your system. And uh, there is more. Your screen has another CPU and then therefore it's separate firmware. And of course, what's, um, that's a kind of well-known one, the hard drive firmware that controls the disk access. It's um, another target for ransomware. And um, one more, the um, unique card, uh, for um, network interface, it has Alyssa. And why, yeah, that's true for the BIOS system, for example, that might be true for the disk controller as well. But you know how many companies are out there that um, eh, do batteries and firmware for the battery? Kind of a lot of them, right? And those are not that um, may, may have you know have the, who's writing the firmware for them, right? Probably you know the person they hire for that, and might be someone who just finished school and uh, very experienced with three computer science courses. So sometimes for that kind of devices, it's even surprising that uh, the, firmware, the firmware even works. So kind of, you know, the big picture is kind of pretty scary. Next slide, please. I want to talk for a few for a bit about the life cycle of ransomware. We were, we were mentioning the entry point. Uh, we are not discussing that, right? But you will get hit because it's as easy as getting a virus or a malware in your system. Then there is the operation. And here, you don't really know that you have been hit by, uh, by uh, malware because um, I mean, stealthily, the, uh, the ransomware is kind of either encrypting files or exfiltrating inform uh, content of the files or performing the different operations that I'll talk uh, about those in a few minutes. But you don't really know that you have been hit yet. Then the next step is the, oh, ouch. Then, um, if um, they were ransomware encrypted your files, then you are not able to access your system any longer. Or if your files will exfiltrate, you are kind of in fear that they will uh, disclose that information, reveal the information. So in any in both cases, now you have. You have uh, two choices. You know, do you pay, and then you get get your system uh, operational again and until the next time you get hit, right? And if you pay, they say, okay, that person is paying. Let's try again uh, in a not too far future. Or do you have a recovery strategy? That means, did you prepare properly so could so you could restore? your system promptly to be operational again. And uh, that's basically the rest of this talk is about um, how do we do this. Next slide, please. I want to 
talk a bit more about um, the specific uh, attack operations related with uh, ransomware. And um, we start with the most intuitive one, which is, uh, okay, we want ransomware will overwrite my files, encrypt it then, or read the files to exfiltrate the information, or create an um, um, arbitrary file. If we create arbitrary files, we are connecting to um, the, the second uh, bullet in this list because I could the attacker from somewhere uh, could create a, and um, a file that is kind of executable code and then combine. Exec basically executing any code uh, mal the ransomware wants with uh, writing files, they basically can do uh, anything they want in the system. And of course, they can call any library function or uh, on a remote server, or basically they can do anything they they want. Even I mean. and program the system or any process and they can do they can see um because that information is uh i mean the operating system provide is uh is available for viewing so uh run just look at that and it could be such uh, very simple such as reading in the slash uh directory of the file system or you can use uh tools like for example the the dynamics, the binary analysis and instrumentation tool. And next slide, please. In addition to reading the state of every of the processes, you can use the same tools to modify the state of the process of the or of the programs in execution in the system. And you can do that to longer to the user, or you do that to processes belonging to the operating system. If um, the ransomware attack got by any chance a privilege, um, can perform privilege operations, then they can't uh, do anything to the operating system in um, changing it and uh, get uh, having it to behave in uh, any way they want. Uh, next slide, please. So that uh, uh, Bart, you are on again. Okay, thank thank you, Alyssa. So um, just this is just kind of like a cartoon like diagram of of the system, and we just want you to have this in mind as as I tell you about some of the really bad things that can happen to your computer, and how you might detect and recover from them. But we just think of programs running inside of a host, talking to a file system, we have a backup agent, we have a database server somewhere out there, local or remote, storage server for like file servers, backup recovery server. So what we've done is we've just tried to, we try to reduce this picture down to its simplest form and then study the places where bad things can happen. So let's, let's look at some bad things. So um, the first one is um, your file the most basic one. So this is encrypting or exfiltrating the data um, while it's stored, or there's something called data in motion attacks where um, you can uh, put a virus or implant in the system that um, encrypts data as it's going to disk and decrypts as it's coming back from disk, which means all the, the disk system looks like it's behaving normally while you're using it but all the data on the disk is encrypted. And so at the moment of attack, the, the attacker just deletes the encryption key from memory, crashes it, and when the system reboots, all the data on disk is encrypted and cannot be accessed. It also means anytime you're doing backups of your data, you're backing up encrypted data that nobody can decrypt. So this is, this is a very, now, um, this is a scenario that we were working with with NATO over 10 years ago and reported to them 
and this is not a, something we know how to do an attack, but it's not an attack in the wild yet. But we're trying to give you an idea of some of the things that we're, we're trying to give you an idea of things you have to worry about now, like your, your data being encrypted. And we're also trying to look at things that are coming down the road so researchers can be working on them. Now, um, whether your local data is encrypted or whether it's encrypted to a file server, encrypted to a database server, the attack is really the same thing. It's the same game, same thing the attackers are doing. The good news is, and very important is, there are tools out there for detecting these attacks early and trying to stop them. You know, Tripwire, Enterprise Networks, Change Tracker, SolarWinds, um, Event Manager, Separatist Directory Server, that's for Active Directory specifically. So <clears throat> there are very good tools out there that if you're not running them under your critical systems, you should be. Now, um, Alyssa mentioned earlier, backup and virtualization. You need to make sure that you back up your systems regularly. Um, and you need to test them. So if you're doing backups and you haven't done a recovery exercise to say, can I restore a system? You're not doing that once every month to make sure your backups are good and your process is working. You don't actually know if those backups are really good data saved out there or just random bytes written to a disk that are useless. So now, and then what we're saying is virtualize, virtualize, virtualize. Everything you run on every one of your servers should be in a VM or container, system container. And those VMs or system containers should be stored on a backup system, right ones only backup system. So if something crashes, you can just pull the VM off the shelf, put it on a new node, put it on a recovery node or throw it in the cloud, it all the same for a VM and you're on, the, you're on your feet again. This is probably one of the most powerful recovery techniques to be thinking about for doing that. Okay. Um, now, you know, we're looking ahead in the future. As I said, data and motion attacks are hard to implement for a lot of interesting technical reasons. And are, um, so that we haven't seen any yet but they are also beyond the ability of current tools and backup techniques to recover from. So there's a little bit of a nervous kind of <clears throat> tension there. Okay, so um, backup servers. Uh, that, so you can encrypt the data as it's being written to the backup server. This is a data in motion attack. Similar to file system attacks, uh, you want detection tools. These detection tools are often looking for unexpectedly large quantities of um, encrypted data on disk. It's easy um, using entropy calculation techniques to tell whether data is like reasonable text or even a program code versus purely random data. There's well understood techniques for that. So the tools are good at doing that. Um, you know, for, um, for your backup server, protecting your backup server, it, your backup server has to be a separate beast can't be in the same administrative domain as your other servers. It shouldn't have anything else running on it, no other services running on it. It may even have separate identity management access. So if anybody cracks the rest of your system, your backup server should be completely separate um, with a restricted group of people, with a restricted group of services there ready for you to access. So um, as, we, as we mentioned, um, data in motion attacks, are there over the horizon, though they haven't they haven't hit yet. But hitting your backup server, if it's not particularly isolated, protected, is something that can happen and is happening. Firmware, Alyssa has showed you that scary picture of your laptop that has so many computers, your laptop, your desktop, your server. There's so many computers in your computer. Who knew? I'm gonna ransom by controlling your battery and I'll power down your computer if you don't pay my ransom in 15 minutes. And every couple of hours, I'll let you come up for 15 minutes and ask for the ransom again, or I'll power your computer down again. It's um, so so over my overriding uh, your BIOS. Modern, it's called UFE in modern words or device firmware. Now, the device manufacturers, especially the CPU manufacturers, have been trying to make this really difficult. So firmware is signed, your OS kernel is signed, lock in a trusted processing module, a special cryptographic secure place that's in your processor chip. Um, so, um, so if 
um, if you're doing everything right, this should not be possible. But let's also mention that, you know, what, what are the odds that a battery manufacturer has any programmers that even have a computer science degree, let alone, <clears throat> let alone any security training. And um, I had a very good, I had a really interesting conversation with the chief firmware security architect for Intel. And we were talking about, you know, what firmware out there is signed and properly written. And, and his answer was not as much as we'd like. So um, a keyboard attack is great. A keyboard, you know, if I take over your keyboard and the firmware, I can have the computer type anything you want. And there's certain operations that your computer will only let you do via keyboard. Not, no system program can do only like setting a boot password. BIOS uses something called point of presence detection. And it will only let you set a boot password if you do it from a keyboard. No amount of system root administrator program running a computer can set your boot password. BIOS won't list it. But if I take over your keyboard, I can tell your keyboard to talk to your BIOS instead of boot password. So, um, so these techniques, firmware, are, um, are very difficult to detect. Um, if I attack your disk controller, um, the firmware there, I can hide anything I want on disk. It can look like the disk is working normally, but I can hide stuff in unused backup blocks on the disk. So very stealthy and very persistent, you know, across reboots, across system upgrades, across anything, the malware will stay present. But ransomware could be, you know, you could, if this, if ransomware got in there and you say, I'll reload the operating system, well, when the operating system came back up, the malware is still, the ransomware is still hiding your disk in your, uh, so <clears throat> these are, these are very worrisome kind of attack. Now, fortunately, there's tools out there. Um, Eclipsium and Binnerly are, are there to detect unauthorized changes to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, firmware. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second, because it was just an attack two weeks ago, um, <clears throat> or just a potential attack that was caught by Eclipsium two weeks ago. Now, NIST, or National Institute of Standards Technology, have this SP-800 series of security documents, which are promoting a, a huge number of really wonderful security practices. Um, SP-800-193 is there for standards for detecting firmware tampering. Um, nobody's adopted that one. You can't do anything about that as a user. This is something the manufacturers have to do. Um, it'd be really nice if all the manufacturers adopted HV 100 193 because that's sitting there waiting there to help us. Um, the whole um, boot encrypted, um, signed encrypted boot module, signed encrypted firmware that, that when your system's booting, it's checking each stage that each piece is signed by the manufacturer with a valid key. This is called um, this is called boot guard or hardware valid, uh, validated boot, depending on which manufacturer. It's combined um, with secure boot and TPMs. So um, if all that's working, that's that's helping making this more difficult. So it's reducing the attack surface, not eliminating it. But you can turn off secure boot and you can disable your TPM in your BIOS. And sometimes installations do that because some piece of software doesn't work with it turned on. So you really need to check your systems to make sure that secure boot and TPM are enabled in your BIOS. Because you may be walking out there on the tightrope with no safety net. So this, these are features that are there now for you, just um, <clears throat> could be turned off. You know? um, one of the things that we're looking at in our research project is to do a survey of firmware practices, coding, signing, delivery. Um, uh, we want to actually make us, we want to actually see how we know there's out there. We don't know how big it is yet. And that's, that's, that's something we want to, when we put our research hats on, try to do a little more work on so we know what to, uh, what kind of things we have to be warning people about. So just, um, just a few weeks ago, one of a large manufacturer of motherboards, um, um, the version of BIOS they installed had a mechanism in there to allow the BIOS to upgrade itself automatically. So your BIOS down in 
so your by UFE really, because what the modern term is, um, would allow the firmware to be updated automatically. And it wasn't written by a good programmer, so you could actually spoof the source and you could force anybody's computer that had this motherboard to update their firmware to whatever firmware you wanted to hand it. So I could force your computer, if you came from this company, if you used a, a, from the company called Gigabytes motherboard, I could force you to update your firmware um, and with, without you even knowing about it. So this is real stuff out there. This was caught by Eclipsium. So uh, that tool, I, I don't have any stake in that company. So, but it was really cool to see their tool caught this and reported it. Um, the operating system. Now, if things like, um, if, if your, your TPM and Secure Boot and Boot Guard are all working and the OS is delivering you, uh, the bootloader is signed, the, the first boot block of the operating system is signed, all these things, when you boot your operating system, there's a lot of loading, checking, loading, checking, loading, the next thing, checking, till finally the OS is really in memory running. And there should be a good chain of possession signing of all this. So that should be hard to attack these days unless you find a hole in that. Now a simpler attack is just take over, um, is if I get in, just change user passwords. If I get into the system and I change all the passwords, you can't log in. Okay. So that's, so there are some really simple approaches. Um, so prevention is the, all the same things we talked about for firmware, running, running, the, running good tools, making sure that all these trusted features are turning on. And if you have an encrypted hard drive, and by the way, almost every major laptop and desk side computer you buy has disk encryption turned on automatically. Great protection feature. Somebody steals your computer, they can't pull out the hard drive and dump its contents. It's a great feature. Um, but if somebody attacks your OS and you can't boot and you want to reinstall the OS, the first thing it's going to ask you is, give me the encryption key for your hard drive. And if you haven't written it down and escrowed it somewhere safe, not on your file system, <clears throat> somewhere safe and recoverable, um, then you're not going to be able to restore your system, even though you've got a hard drive full of perfectly good stuff. Um, okay, this, this is a table. I'm going to I'm going to point you to serve our paper we wrote, which has all this stuff. And I'm not expecting you to decrypt all the acronyms. On the left, FSA is file server attack. SSA storage server, a file. But uh, so file system attack, storage server, which is file server, data um, database server attack. Um, backup server attack, operating system attack, firmware attack. That's what those funny things are. But what I wanted to do is show you this table of what we found reported in the wild. Which of these categories of things are out there? So attacking your file server, um, we see lots of instances of tools. These are not attacks, but these are tools out there that can do the attack. So you can multiply that. And if you look at the one that says, one of the, down the file server, one that says zero, you see MOT, it means data in motion attacks. We've seen no data in motion attacks, I've told you that. Storage server attacks, we've seen those, people attacking them because they're not protectly, properly protected, isolated, um, whatever, uh, but we see no data in motion attacks. We've need, uh, they haven't seen, we haven't seen any attack on database servers or backup servers yet. Uh, we've seen attacks on the operating system, especially things like encrypting file names. I don't have to encrypt your files. I just have to encrypt the file names. Now you can't find your files. Or changing passwords. And we've seen none of the kind of firmware attacks. We have seen problems with firmware, like that one I showed you from Eclipsium. But this is just to give you an idea. Now, um, if you want a lot more details of this, uh, we'll point you at our report towards the end. OK, so let's just look at some basics. Um, and this is going to be a little repetitive, but I wanted to put them all together at the end of the talk. Um, what do you do? How, do? how do you make yourself, you know, a friend of mine, one of my high school buddies, uh, had spent his career as a cop. 
And he's and he used to tell me it's not your job to make your house impossible to break into. It's your job to make your house more difficult than your neighbor's house to break into. Okay. <clears throat> so while we can make our systems 100 percent secure, we can raise the bar high enough that we'll not be the ones who get hit. Okay. It's like the old joke of running away from the bear. Um, okay, so virtualize. Now you will get hit, and if you virtualize, bring your service. You can bring your host back out just by restoring a VM. It doesn't get any easier than that. Okay, um, and so this is important. Um, your backups. You should have good backup, um, good practices, um, and so backups should be right once. So you should never. So whatever backup system you should not allow backups to ever be overwritten. Um, your backup server should be physically secure and separate. Somebody should not be able to walk into your into your server room and do that. Um, uh, your authentication server, the thing that gives you access to your system, if you're um, if you're running your own authentication or single sign-on, it should be isolated. It shouldn't have other things uh, running on it. It should be should limited people that have access to that system, and it should have separate access enforcement. So. File system recovery, you got to test that. It's great if you're doing file system recovery. If you're not doing file system recovery, oh my God. But if you are, like most of us are, that's good. But test it. Make sure you make sure it works. Um, use monitoring tools. I've mentioned a bunch of different monitoring tools at all different levels. Pick one that works for you, um, and and try it out. Um, make sure this is. Generic, you've heard this a bazillion times, um, but I'll just say that make sure you're updated to the most recent release of the operating system. Um, if not, isolate that computer, or software defined networking, or virtual LANs. Nobody can get to it from outside. Um, because make sure that all the most recent signed software and signed firmware is, uh, is available there. Um, make sure the secure boot isn't disabled. Make sure your TPM, this is that encryption mechanism that allows uh, encryption keys to be stored safely inside your CPU chip or next to your CPU chip. Make sure that's not been disabled in your BIOS. Um, if, you're, um, uh, if you've got login information, authentication information, things like that, make sure that gets backed up too because uh, you want to be able to restore the, if you restore the computer, but you can't restore the user database, that could slow down your recovery a lot. Um, and if you're encrypted your disks, and most of us are running encrypted hard drives, whether we know it or not, the, the disk, the laptop I am speaking on right now, which was bought about two years ago, it came with encryption already turned on, which is a good thing. Um, so it's probably the case for you. Make sure that you've escrowed your encryption keys. That way, if, if you have to reload an OS, you can uh, you can still access your disk. You're not reloading all your data. Okay, so um, uh, we wrote this report, um, and it's out there. I'll leave the screen up for a while. It's out there, which has a lot of technical details in it. Um, we're going to write some shorter ones, which are more operational, more best best practices. But this is we wanted to get the full report out there. Um, we also have some a recent addition to our guide for securing so secure software. Um, uh, let me say um, so. Uh, we had a question from one of uh, the attendees about um, are there data sets for ransomware attack. Um, I think you, if your data to see if your ransomware tools are detecting it, uh, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think I've seen data sets like you're describing out there for ransomware attacks. There might be, but um, I don't know of any immediately. Okay, um, with that, uh, we have time for questions for Alyssa and myself. Yes, you, so I'm... I'm going to grab the screen back and let people type uh, one second. Hang on. Uh, yeah, you grab the screen back and I'll drop the your ransomware paper in the um, in the chat so you all have that. Thank you. 
Um, thanks everybody for coming to this today's presentation. Um, our next webinar is going to be August 28th at 10 a.m. Central. The topic is the Clemson Adaptive Framework. Our presenter is uh, Jeremy Grisha. Also, um, a few updates about events. PERC is coming up in um, next week, actually. So if, if, if any of you are attending PERC, um, maybe you'll see some members of Trusted CI there. And then we've got EDUCAUSE's annual conference up in Chicago, October 9th through 12th. And then not long after that, our NSF uh, Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Summit is October 24th through 26th in Berkeley, California. We are very close to opening up registration, but I don't have any um, specific updates about that yet. So if you go to trustedci.org, you'll see a link for the summit and you can um, follow uh, the information that we have available there so far. And it looks like, um, oh, they, the person responded, thanks for the great presentation. Oh, thank you for coming. Uh, do we have any other questions from the attendees? Well, I think, oh, here we go. Can you elaborate on the term on the horizon? Uh, what what's time frames are we looking at, Bart? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's that's the million dollar question. Um, are we going to get hit with a massive data? Oh, Bart, pardon the interruption. Your audio cut out again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I said that's a million dollar question. Are we going to get hit? Oh, unfortunately, sorry, it didn't take. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I switched microphones. One should always have a backup. I'm a pilot. You should always have a plan B, right? Um, um, th as I said, that's the million dollar question. Um, is there somebody ready to come out with a data in motion encryption tool, mal uh, ransomware toolkit tomorrow, and we're just waiting for it to drop? Or is it going to happen a year, two years, five years? Um, uh, we, we just have. This is the reason why we're putting out this report and talking about some of these challenges is to see if we can get people working on these problems. Um, the, uh, the whole idea of unsigned firmware, which is just, just a disaster waiting to happen. Um, we don't know the extent of it. We know there's some out there. We don't know the extent of it. That's why we're gonna start, hopefully in the next coming year, a research project on surveying that. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, um, uh, NATO's not driving this, but a little background, Alyssa and I worked, uh, we worked in a funny area, um, we were working on, working on cybersecurity for maritime domain, and so we, we, we worked actively in NATO, and so we were, we were doing a vulnerability, in-depth vulnerability assessment of the software that controls about half the container terminals in the world. In container shipping, that's 90% of the world's commerce goes by those containers. So this is a non-trivial domain for the world. And NATO was the one who originally funded that. We were working under their auspices and we developed this data in motion attack um, scenario as part of that. So um, uh, that's that's informed a lot of the stuff we've done. It accelerated, you know, we had this data in motion ransomware attack scenario. It was classified at the time um, 10 years ago. It wasn't classified, it was confidential. It didn't actually go through classification. It was confidential. Ten, we had that 10 years ago. So that was helping us get um, all the work you're seeing that we're talking about here is under the auspices of trusted CI. Um, and uh, um, so we're doing that, uh, which is why we're talking about availability um, uh, um, and uh, uh, Confidentiality, uh, and availability and integrity. We weren't talking about, we're talking about availability and integrity, not confidentiality, because a lot of times in science, we're less concerned with that, what we're doing with personal health data, or personal information data. Um, there was a question about should it run VMs even on your laptop? Um, laptops, it's, that's a really interesting question because laptops are usually pretty straightforward to recover if you've been doing a good job backing up your data. 
But let me ask you a question. What software are you running on your laptop? How many of you out there in Radio Land, as we used to say, can give me a list of all the software that you would need to re reload into your laptop if somebody took over your laptop? You, you have your, you've been doing a good job. You've got your backup disk sitting there. Um, you've made a copy of your backup disk offsite. So you're like super careful. Um, and now you say all oh, this reload Windows or Mac OS or whatever it is I get hit with Linux. Um, do you know how many programs, services, tools you have to reload to get your computer back up to snuff? So um, the advantage of running in a VM is everything's there. So, um, <clears throat> but it's usually- and, and of course you need to uh, back up uh, VM uh, frequently too, but that's way easier to do, of course. Right. So, so I don't necessarily say you have to run out and run a VM on your laptop. Um, any service, any service you're, you or your organization are running for sure. Um, but if you're not doing that, you need to know what's on your laptop so you know you have to restore. I keep a, I keep a, a folder which I call installs. And that gets backed up with the rest of my data. And every time I go to install something on my computer, I drop color into my installs folder. And this is a little personal, maybe I should put it in the best practice thing. Um, this is something I do personally. And that way, if I ever recover my system, I can just grab the install folder off my backup server and just run all those installers. Now they won't necessarily running the latest updated installer, but all these old installers bring in the newer installers. So that's a good practice for, um, for your laptop. And that's a little less overhead than trying to run a VM. Really good questions. I think I only have two uh, <laughs> extra programs running on my machine because everything we do is in the cloud nowadays. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I'm not um, a software developer or a computer software specialist. So uh, any other questions from um, the audience? We've got a couple of minutes left here. Do you have any other maritime stories you can tell the audience? <laughs> um, <clears throat> none, none that I can directly. <clears throat> well, I will say um, we were at uh, our, this NATO cybersecurity facility um, two weeks after Maersk sh shipping got hit. And um, so this was five or six years ago, and and this is was a this was a predecessor to the war in Ukraine. Um, Maersk shipping, which controls seventy percent of seventeen percent of the world's maritime shipping, um, had their own software, and they had they had an office in the Ukraine, and so they had um, their software running in Ukraine, and they had loaded a tax module, the equivalent of the US IRS payment module um, for Ukraine into their computer, that module had been hacked by the Russians. So the Russians got into the Maersk network. Now the Maersk um, environment, they have 20,000 20, computers, think desktop, shipboard, port side, <clears throat> back office, total 20,000 computers, all in one active directory, single domain. And for those of you who know what that means, it means if you get administrator on anybody's computer anywhere, um, you are now administrator in the entire Maersk network. So the Russians got in, looked around, and said, it's a good day to cause chaos. And they just tested out not Petcho, which basically zeroed every computer inside of the Maersk company. They were nothing. There was nothing bootable inside the entire company, except for one com one computer sitting in an office in Africa that was sitting in a repair room, taken offline because they needed a new network card, and that had a copy of their Active Directory domain, so they could restore it. And that required a uh, James Bond-like thing of somebody flying from there to some country they could fly to without a visa from Africa, and then somebody from the Maersk 
headquarters in London flying down to that company, handing off the hard drive to help them restore their environment. But they were offline. It took hundreds of Microsoft field engineers to reload Windows on their network and so on. Somebody asked, um, uh, there were, uh, hang on, there's some questions here. Uh, whoops, where did my, whoops, um, I lost a question. There was a question there about quantum. Um, it was, uh, will any changes in cybersecurity research, um, will there be any changes as we will get to quantum computing in the next five to 10 years? Well, it depends on how fast we can come up with a quantum computer that can implement Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is a quantum algorithm for doing factoring, which will help, uh, basically discrete log algorithm, which will help you break most public key encryption algorithms. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot of work. There's a lot of security research going on now. It was called post-quantum cryptography. And that's that's going to be the thing. We need to, we need to not only get algorithms out there that we feel that are quantum secure, but we need to get them into every single device that has a web interface. And that includes your toaster and refrigerator and whatever else has a web interface these days. So half the problem is coming up with these algorithms and the cryptographers are working on it, doing a good job. The other half of the problem is convincing the entire world to do encryption algorithms that will be quantum secure. <clears throat> Um, and the question is, is the, uh, um, is the frequency attacks correlated with the level of difficulty of the given attack? Absolutely. That's always the case. Um, they'll pick the low hanging fruit. Why should I, why should I digitally attack your car with a sophisticated man in the middle of attack when you forgot to lock the door and I can just get in and drive it off? Um, I'll do the other stuff if I have to. If you have a really, really expensive car and you lock it, I'll probably try to figure out the other stuff. Generically, I won't. And yes, you're welcome to uh, cor uh, correspond with Alyssa and I on questions you have to follow up. We're here, we're part of Trusted CI. We're, we're here to help the community. That's, that's our job. Well, thank you so much for uh, presenting today. <laughs> Any questions that you have for Bart and Alyssa, you can forward them to me and I can forward them along or you can contact them directly. I will be uh, posting the video from this presentation and the slides later today. So you, you're free to share with colleagues. Any last comments, Bart and Alyssa? Yes, be smart. No, thank you, <laughs> thank yes, you all for, thank you, Paul, thank you all for listening. All right, with that, I will wrap things up. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you next month. Bye everybody.